I have a question. Was Jesus married? The answer is that he is currently married to the church. You, hopefully, are a part of the literal bride of Christ. What does that mean? The greatest blind spot of modern Protestant theology, in my opinion, is ecclesiology, the study of the church. Reading the church fathers, the biggest difference between uh, these early Christians and reading modern theology is that they are almost exclusively talking about the church and not the individual. They're talking all about church discipline and what cooperation with fellow Christians should look like. They are pretty clear that the body of Christ is one body. I think that is why lots of non-magisterial Protestants who look into the church fathers um, feel convicted and end up converting to Roman Catholicism. But what Protestants have to realize is that we are actually best situated to live out this ecclesiology of unity in the body of Christ. For one, we are the Christians who have the requisite language and theology to recognize the actual body of Christ. The church fathers indeed had similar language in being able to refer to the invisible church that Protestants use today, although they didn't use the, that word because it's, you know, the, because of the history of theology, but they had the concept in the same way that that Protestant word refers to. And so we are best situated to use the spiritual gifts and the presence of God that exists wherever two followers of Christ are gathered. But unfortunately, Protestants do not act in that unity. Whenever you want to see how to properly evaluate the state of something, you have to look at where it is coming from and where it is going. If something is coming out of chaos and into order, it is going to look messy still, but you can rightly say that this is headed in the right direction. We have been trending in the opposite direction, unfortunately. We've been trending further toward disunity and splintering. I've heard a lot of Protestants lament this, but very little is actually done or suggested to be done to turn the trends in the other direction without giving up this ability to recognize the spirit where it can be found. One of the greatest advantages of the Anglican tradition is that it was a national church. It's not called Cranmarianism or the Book of Common Prayerism. In the past, it forged a broad tent church, which was welcoming to a plethora of theological perspectives and who simply shared a common identity. Because of this, they could maintain a single structure and unity, not without great struggle though. My denomination, the Anglican Church of North America, is actually pretty good at translating this strategy into the North American context. It is common to hear people discuss the threefold system for the types of parishes in the ACNA, where there are charismatic, evangelical, and high church slash Anglo-Catholic plans across the country. Often it is broken down simply to low church and high church, but I think it is notable that charismatic is included. It is such a modern and especially American phenomenon that it simply had to have a space in such a national church. This is not really just a theological Anglican distinctive. This is what the church has commanded us to look like. What the church is not supposed to be is a theological enclave where you find the people who agree with your systematic theology. Many Protestants, because we were forced to self-segregate on theological grounds in the 16th century, forget that this was Martin Luther's last resort. It was Jan Hus's last resort too, and it was so far down his priority list that he preferred instead to die. In fact, it could be argued that the Church of Rome's insistence that the eccentricities of their theology be demanded on its congregants is the very reason that Protestants had to leave rather than the other way around. However, what the Roman Catholics are better at than we are is establishing themselves at the center of communities in Catholic countries, often involving a variety of people from many walks of life and levels of commitment. They are often derided because of how few of their mo modern congregants actually believe their official teachings. Rad trad Catholics often wag their fingers at the church hierarchy for forgetting to catechize cradle Catholics, but actually think that this forgetting is often intentional. For instance, has transubstantiation, which only a very marginal amount of Roman Catholic congregants actually claim to believe, ever actually been taught infallibly? I know that's a complicated word, but bear with me. 
it's implied that if you actually denied it, you might have to face some church discipline. But I don't think that Pope or the bishops particularly care about the theological opinions of congregants as long as they congregate to eventually hear the essentials of the gospel. This is good, right? Even for a Catholic who thinks something like transubstantiation is very important and that they need a vehicle for sharing this idea, it might be beneficial for them to not require it, really, practically require it. They say they require it. You can't become a priest, you know, unless you believe it. But they don't actually require it for attendance. Non-denominational evangelicals do the exact same thing. The non-denoms are to the Protestants what the Catholics who don't believe in transubstantiation are to Roman Catholicism. Except they started ordaining their own pastors and creating their own churches. This is not a bad thing either. The seeker-safe model of very doctrinally limited church has brought thousands to Christ in otherwise totally lost parts of America. Theologically interested Christians often complain about the limits of non-denominational worldview and other eccentricities of the non-denoms, but what we need to learn from the Catholics is that we need to make a space for them in our churches. In fact, these non-denominational Christians are often way more devoted to Christ than the Roman Catholic congregants I compared them to earlier. Catechizing them would actually be a much simpler task than catechizing the moral therapeutic deists who had their kid baptized in Immaculate Conception for grandma's sake, but otherwise does not see a relationship with the creator of the universe as anything more than a personality quirk of some old people. Lack of discipline is Satan's highway. As many criticisms we may have of Roman Catholicism and their theology, Protestant lack of coordination has made nearly every Protestant institution uniquely vulnerable to Satan. This is the story of every single mainline church in America. This battle with discipline and the retreat of doctrine. Even the ones like the SBC, which have succeeded in fighting this, and the LCMS, which have succeeded in fighting this, this um, loss of doctrine, did so only because of church discipline. So as we build a new nation that is Christian at the core, if we want it to stay that way, Protestant Christians need to build broad churches that have theological orders within it, rather than theological orders that have their own churches. Protestantism is uniquely situated for this task. How is it that when we left the Roman Catholic Church, for among other issues, insisting on theological unity in non-essential areas, that we ended up more particular than they are? Let's try to imagine what the church is supposed to look like for a second. In the New Testament, for hundreds of years after, each town and city had one church where the citizens within a reasonable distance all congregated. Paul doesn't have Epistle A to the Corinthians who, are, who ate food sacrificed to idols and Epistle B to the Corinthians who did not. They all went to the same church on Sunday, and even though one of them was theologically correct, they disagreed and maintained institutional unity in the face of a hostile outside world. What can be proposed, and what I am proposing, is this, but think of it more like a thought experiment than something I'm dogmatically um, demanding of Protestants right now. Next Sunday, we all go to church exactly where we've always been going. These churches might still call themselves First Methodist or St. John the Evangelist Anglo-Catholic or even Community Bible Church. We all tithe, all of us, give the 10%. That money, that social power, is given first to our church, a cut goes up the chain to our order. As a committed Anglican who loves Cranmer and Pusey, Laud and Hooker, I would be in the Anglican order. But you might be in the Methodist order, the Baptist order, or the Evangelical order. The Lutherans and the Bible Church folks are going to have to fight over the title Evangelical order, probably, but they'll figure it out. These orders can be organized the exact same way that our denominations are right now. Nothing new necessary, just a label change for now. But up that hierarchy, the organization does not stop. The orders all give some minuscule portion of their little portion of the tithe to the general synod. That general synod, general synod is an authoritative body which asserts minimal theological authority, insisting only on the very basic five sole of Protestantism and the Apostles and Nicene creeds but with sizable enough authority and dignity in the national life of the country. 
For instance, the pro-life organizations, which are now affiliated with denominations, should start looking to the general synod for affiliation. Politicians who want the Christian vote should try to get good press from general synod-affiliated media. The general synod should urge unity, common purpose, and simplicity. The heads of the general synod should be asking the Methodists and the Anglican orders if they really think they should remain separate. Why can't Methodists go to the same church as an Anglican evangelical? How about we rename some stuff? On the ground, the evangelical ACNA church and the conservative Methodist church in your city rebrand and become one congregation. You start to make connections with many more Christians in your city you didn't even know about. The Presbyterians and the Reformed Anglicans start to ask each other if church polity is really that important. At the very least, this would start to solve some pastor shortage problems some denominations are having. If you think that it, this is not possible, I beg you to study the formation of the ACNA, the Anglican Church of North America. It was messy, for sure, and we are still dealing with weird diocese maps and other organizational problems. But really, I don't know a single conservative Anglican, both former Episcopalians and those from the smaller Anglican denominations that existed before the formation of the ACNA that regret this reorganization. Yes, there are still very conservative Anglican churches which have not joined the ACNA for various reasons. And they are very loud online, although I've never met any in person. But different Anglicans still have very different theological opinions. I have tons of conversations with fellow Anglicans where I find I agree more with Lutherans or Eastern Orthodox Christians than I do with them on very particular theological issues. But when we put on Advent lessons and carols together, you wouldn't know that. What the Christian life must be centered around is worship and charity and love, and not predestination. It wasn't when Luther began to believe in sola fide that he nailed the 95 Theses, but when Johann Tetzel began preaching door to door, jeopardizing people's souls with his actions. In order to become the center of Christian communities again, Christians must put tertiary theological issues away. It's not an option. You have to ask yourself, what do I care about more? My doctrine of eternal security or protecting the lives of infants? Single predestination or the state-sanctioned mutil genital mutilation of children against the wishes of their parents? If you do not see the obvious benefit of this level of organization, I want you to look up the richest churches in the world. They are also the most hierarchical and most organized. Despite their meager numbers, the LDS Church has made huge amounts of money. The Roman Catholic Church is the largest non-governmental source of charity and social welfare in the world. In the United States, the Episcopal Church has had the most presidents and most government representatives, highly disproportionate to their percentage of the population. Being jealous and covetous is sinful when it is for our own things, but we are commanded to be jealous for the Lord. We must be covetous of the church, his body, with every breath. There is very little else I admire about the LDS and Episcopal churches. But if I am allowed to borrow from a tradition I do admire, the Methodists, I would like to ask, why should the devil have all the best tombs? This belief that the lack of authority and unity is a strength and not a weakness is quite literally from Satan. Overtly anti-Christian organizations do not make this mistake of lack of coordination. If we are forced to defend each of our homesteads from the KGB by ourselves with Winchesters and faulty ammunition, we would start to wish we joined the White Army a decade earlier. I think our non-denominational brothers and sisters in Christ have done amazing work, and they are likely truly saved. In fact, their disaffiliating from denomination and systematic theologies perhaps makes them best situated to be restructured for unity in the body of Christ. What anyone studying religion now can tell you is that contrary to popular assumption, the religions which demand very little of you are dying, and the religions which demand the most are growing. We are social creatures. We want to serve a social purpose. We are made to build churches, and the ultimate and highest form of that building is the church. The Bible tells us, and the Shepherd of Hermas illustrates very well, that we are living stones meant to build one great tower. It is the inversion of the Tower of Babel that is made by God, and not by mankind, to bring heaven to earth and not earth to heaven. Where they built a tower upward that crumbled and they became many nations who no longer could work together, we will build a kingdom outward and make many nations one. If Jesus is the new Adam, his wife, the church, is the new Eve. If Adam was the entrance of sin into the lineage of man because he followed the bad choice of his spouse, 
then it is through the church, as we become members in her, that we choose to follow Christ as the exit of sin from the lineage of man. That is a daunting task, but it is our duty as Christians to build that. So start building. 